All right, welcome back. We're live, and it's uh, game 2014. Uh, that's Mobile Game Development 1 in the fall 2020 semester at George Brown, and it's week three, part one of our broadcast. We're going to be talking about mobile game design user interfaces, uh, or mobile user interface design, which is probably the way we should call it. Um, so where are we this week? We're here at week three. Um, where we're building our first mobile interface for Unity, but I'm also talking about a bit of design. A um, couple of notes uh, administratively. One is that next week you'll have a little test on basics, the stuff that we've talked about so far in terms of design. It'll be a true-false multiple choice test. You'll get it in the beginning of the week and you'll have until the end of the week um, <clears throat> to, uh, to complete it. One thing I should probably do um, is <clears throat> put my link, excuse me, I'm dying, uh, in the video to up on Blackboard, which I should do right now. One day when it feels like doing what it's supposed to do. And this sometimes fails on Blackboard anyway, because, hey, let's do this thing. And hopefully it's going to work. It may not. If it doesn't, oh, man. <clears throat> let's try that again. Is it going to work this time, or is it going to go, meh? Oh, it's going to work. That's awesome. So you should see for people who need support. <clears throat> excuse me. My voice is dying today. For people who need support, then this should be uh, a link to the live uh, feed on YouTube. should be up now on Blackboard. So please look there if you want to get uh, real-time closed captioning. Back to this. So we're here at... We're doing mobile interface design today, and um, next week you got the little theory on basics. Part one, uh, assignment one, part one is due next week. Some people had some really weird things where they said, I don't know why, but uh, they thought it was due the following week. No, it's due next week. Um, you're also going to get part two of your assignment, which is going to be the logic piece um, to make to make your game work. And you only have, like I said, a couple short weeks to do it. So. Um, some people, I'm sure, would have already started to code their part two. Some people. Some people won't do part two until I tell them to. But um, there's nothing wrong with starting, you know, ahead of time and getting your uh, first part done. I highly recommend that you, um, you work on um, finishing part one as fast as possible to get, a, to get a head start on part two. You don't have a lot of time. Okay, so that's that week. Um, and then as we go towards the uh, uh, mid-semester time frame, we will have um, additional chances to do... There's a practical test that's happening on week seven, just letting you know. So again, we're sitting at week three, so four short weeks away, we're going to do something practical. Will I get... Again, I will, I'll not force you to do it in class, necessarily. There, I will give it to you at the beginning of the week, and then you'll have until the end of the week again to get it done. So a single week kind of uh, little demo that I want you to run. All right, so that's where we are today. What are we talking about today? We're going to be talking about uh, the idea of challengers and skill, a little bit about mobile um, user interface design. Um, we're going to talk about flow state a little bit, what that is and how that can help our designs, as well as what the magic interface is. I think I like this magic interface. A little bit about play heuristics. I spent maybe a little bit too much time talking about that in the first section. And then how to learn to make a basic user interface that makes, make, makes you go from scene one to scene two. And how do I go back? Very simple. Okay. That's what we're doing today. If you know how to do all this stuff, awesome. Then you're way ahead of the curve. Um, if you don't, then this is your chance to, you know, to do it together. Let's begin. So what I want to talk first is that every game is a world. And every scene in the game, in this case, from a Unity perspective, or even Unreal, is a game world, if you think about it, right? The purpose then of an interface is to enable the player to step into a magical doorway, if you think about it, that is the game, right? And the interface allows you to do a bunch of stuff. Uh, control, get feedback, right? Um, and a bunch of different things with the game itself. So an adequate, we're going to say an adequate interface, is only enables the player to move around the world in an efficient manner. So it's functional. 
but a great interface considers the whole experience, which is what we're going to be talking about here. So it's not just about making it functional, it's also making it awesome. And how do we do that? So we need to have some considerations. So this lesson goes into details about um, some, you know, other things. It should kind of take in, into fact your experiences here. And now you're sitting at third year, so you should have had exposure to game design and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, one thing is that you're going to have uh, happen to you is when you're building your interfaces, you're going to kind of run into some stuff that uh, ends up uh, hitting you with some unforeseen complexity. And we'll talk about that a bit, especially when it comes to the story arc of your game, if you have such a thing. But even for simplistic games like, for example, um, something like a, um, a Pac-Man clone or a Space Invaders clone, you can get quite interesting if you, if you want to push uh, to make it more interesting. So again, to create enough fun to keep your players coming back, you need to create some kind of, you know, game experience in which each interaction is genuinely fun. This includes things like just the interface itself. The player has a combination of two things, short-term and long-term goals. Short-term goals satisfy immediate needs, immediate enjoyment, and long-term goals persuade the player to return. And this is this kind of goes to the fact, this idea of replayability. So. If you have no long-term goals and everything's just a short-term goal, player's going to play your game once and see you later. Um, then th we're going to be talking about this idea of challenge versus skill, right? So, um, so we want to carefully balance them over time so that the experience doesn't seem too easy or too hard. And this you're going to see is a heuristic we're going to be talking about later on called easy to learn but hard to master. Players are constantly told about their progress towards their goals, and you should have that in the interface. So some kind of progress indicator that even if it's a mini map that shows how far along in the game you are, right? Um, so let's talk about flow a little bit. So the idea is, do you ever feel this? You're playing a game and you've lost yourself in the game. You don't care about yourself. You don't care about the world. All you care about is what you're doing in the game. In sports, uh, there's a, what they call is, they call it being in the zone. Um, but in games, and even in movies, it's calling it's called um, understanding this idea of flow or being in flow state. Actually, it's also um, <clears throat> possible to get to flow state with other activities, like, for example, writing a story or reading a book. We're not going to talk about that cat. Um, so there's a Hungarian-born uh, psychologist, uh, Mihaly, uh, or and I'm going to try this, uh, Cheek Sent Ma Yahi, yeah, all right, it's pretty crazy, um, has pioneered a field called positive psychology, which seeks to understand, I probably butchered that thing, uh, why we have certain experiences such as being in the zone. And what he did was he kind of created this concept of flow that he basically said that certain activities balance this idea of perceived skills versus uh, perceived challenge level. So it doesn't matter what the actual skill is, it's what the perceived versus perceived. When we feel skillful in our activity and the activity is challenging enough, then time seem can somehow blur by and we feel deeply satisfied. And this state of mind is called flow. All right. This idea of flow state. So flow kind of talks about uh, certain experiences and why they're so enjoyable. So you know, our famous psychologist defines eight elements that go into the most enjoyable experiences. So people who experience flow believe they can complete the tasks. That's the first thing. Can I do the game? Do I understand what to do? Right? They concentrate on the activity. So the activity captures their attention, right? And they, their activity is based around them. There is no story without character. And so too, there is no game without a player. Okay. Uh, they want to also receive clearly communicated goals, right? So in other words, I know what to do. I have a goal system in place that's hovering in my screen somewhere that's telling me what to do, right? Um, and I receive immediate feedback uh, during the entire experience. So whether it is my game controller that's rumbling or my music that is dynamic, um, that is giving me feedback that I'm in a battle sequence or my visuals that are showing me explosions or feedback that I've done my job and destroyed the enemy, which whatever those are, all those things together provide my experience to keep me in flow and, you know, create this sense of immersion. 
um, I want to be deeply involved in my task. The, the task has to be challenging enough that I need to put effort into it, all right? Also, I want to have a sense of control so that what I'm doing influences the game world. If what I'm doing has no influence on the game world, I lose my sense of immersion. I pull back and I'm I, generally players get upset. When that happens, I lose concern for self. I don't think about myself at all. I don't think about my environment. I lose a sense of time. Have you ever been in a situation where you're playing a game, you start off and you're going one neck, the next quest. I want to go to the next quest, the next quest. And now suddenly it's one or two in the morning. I think a lot of gamers get that, get to that point where, you know, you're kind of immersed in the game so much that you lose a sense of time or location. Sometimes that even happens when we're, um, when we're, um, you know, reading an email or just engaged in our social media so much that we can almost run into the street and get into an accident. That's why people tell you not to not to uh, text and drive because you get so much into what you're looking at that you, your world around you, you, you lose a sense of awareness sometimes with the world around you. So what we want to do is we want to balance this challenge versus skill idea. So perception is... Uh, really important in game design. So real skill level is one thing, but it doesn't matter what the real skill level is for a player. It's what they think their own skill level is that's important. At the same time, it doesn't matter how the game designer feels the challenge is. It's how the player feels the, the, the challenge is. So one of the challenges is for the game designer, we think it's tough enough or easy enough, and we can't tell that if it's, if it's the right skill level until we do play testing until the players come back and say, you know what, this this level or this part of the level is really easy or it's too easy or it's too difficult, as an example, we need to change elements of the game level to make it more challenging. Kevin, is that you? Or is that, are you, did you come off mute by accident? I think you came off mute by accident. I'll mute you. <clears throat> All right. So this idea of balancing challenge versus skill, what it does is it creates um, a different state of emotion, right? So if we have high skill then, and it's low challenge, we feel relaxed. You know, a good example of that is I'm fighting baddies that I've already figured out how to kill, or I've gone in a level, an area that I've already explored, right? High skill, low challenge, right? I feel relaxed. Sometimes so relaxed that I get, I might even slip the board. Right, depending on if I don't require a lot of skill. If my challenge level is low, bored, like this area here, and I have high skill, that's bad, right? I get to this part here, right? However, if I have um, a high skill and a medium challenge, I feel like I'm in control. I'm navigating the game good enough. It's keeping me engaged. I'm not quite in flow state yet. I'm not in flow state until my skill level and my challenge are in a balance, right? Where I'm having to concentrate at the same time that I'm ha I have I have to use all the acquired skills that I've, I've I've kind of learned through the entire part of the game, right? We can also look at it the other way. This is on the right half. On the other way, if I have a high challenge but a medium skill, I might feel aroused, and arousal is not the arousal that we might think about. It's arousal as in like, I'm turned, like everything is, I'm, I'm hyper aware and I'm, I, it's, it's beyond anxiety. You know, I'm, I've got enough skill that I'm not anxious, but I'm just on, right? I'm not quite in flow state because my skill isn't high enough to be in flow state, but I'm aroused. All right. Um, if I don't have a lot of skill, so low skill and I have high challenge, right? So high challenge, but low skill, then I can feel anxious about being in that game state, all right? I don't know what to do, or maybe I don't know enough of what to do, and there's a lot of stuff coming at me. I may not be able to survive that level, right? Because my skill level is too low. So again, you can see that what's, ha what's happening is we're playing with the player's emotional state, which is the main thing here, right? So we want to create both the interface and the experience so that it you would keep a player closer to the flow state as much as possible. And that's a challenge because there's two things. How do I know a player is got, has, have, has high level of skill? And how do I know that that player is being challenged? I don't until I test. I need to do a lot of testing to figure this stuff out. And for some players who are more experienced, they may not be able to get into flow state. 
one thing to note is that um, we're not going to probably keep uh, a player in flow state. It's almost impossible 100% of the time for them to be in that state. They're going to shift in and out of that state. And the way this can happen with um, uh, <clears throat> many of the players is they're going to ramp up in terms of challenge. They're going to go into areas that are less challenged. They'll move into states of relaxation and back into flow state. Flow state can be quite, you know, tiring to stay into flow state the entire time, right? So instead, what ends up happening is you see players that move in and out of flow state when they're playing the game. Again, this is if the challenge level is significant enough. I'm not going to talk about the other ones. These are for your notes and for this for the test that you're going to get next week. But I'm going to go into source of challenge now. So there's different sources of challenge. One of them is um, interactions. So things that you do with the game. Any kind of um, well, I'm, I'm conflict that I have with my uh, with my enemies or obstacles that I have to avoid. You know, that kind of thing. Also, tactics can be a, sen uh, can be a, a sense of, I can provide a sense of challenge. If I have to use tactics or strategies in order for me to, um, you know, in order for me to be successful in the game, that can also supply a level of challenge. The complexity of a level, especially if there's a puzzle type level, the higher the complexity, the more the challenge, right? And also physical skills. I can only think of things like um, <clears throat> exer games or rhythm games, like let's say something like a Beat Saber, where I have to time my my responses or some kind of timing that I got to do inside of a puzzle, uh, you know, or some kind of adventure game like um, <clears throat> Shadow of the Tomb Raider or something like that, where you must press the button at the right time. Or God of War is another one where I have to keep hitting the button at the right time in order for me to break a hold or attack a monster or do some kind of effect, right? So physical skills come into play as well. Um, or just physical skills in terms of reaction time when you're playing a competitive type game, right? So all these things are areas that can pr produce challenge for us. How do we disrupt flow? Making the game too challenging or not challenging enough. Uh, sudden huge leaps in challenge. So, for example, we start off with a certain level of challenge, and all of a sudden, now you're facing enemies that have multi-stage destruction, um, you know, or something like that. Or maybe it's the level is really complex to navigate, or it speeds up a lot compared to where it was before. Sudden change like that breaks us out of us our immersion, and we're like, wait, holy crap, what's happening, right? <clears throat> and also decreases in challenge, an area where it becomes really relaxed all of a sudden. Um, also breaks us out of flow and puts us into another emotional state. Again, we don't have to be in flow the entire time, right, or our players, but we want to get them there as much as possible to get that engagement going. Um, also changing the, the fundamental, fundamental nature of the fun in the game. So let's say if I change the magic system somehow from one level to the other, or if I change a mechanic that they've been using the entire game and now it's something else. And so the fun is is still fun but different then again I'm kicked out of flow because I'm out of my immerse uh, my immersion and into something else um, one thing to know is that we talked about uh, interfaces as doorways to the game world and in fact that's what they are because that is the only way that we can interact with the with the game world and experience um, you know what the game is about Let's talk about magic interfaces now. Magic game interfaces. The, the magic is really a, an acronym for something else, right? So again, this one of my favorite authors, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, he once stated that uh, any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think that we should have all heard of that by now. And I think whenever I think about that, I'm thinking, you know, maybe the Egyptian pyramids got built by aliens, right? And they came down and we thought there is like, you know, the, the ancient Egyptians thought there were gods. Um, and again, but they weren't. They were just aliens that built the pyramids. And for them, it was technology. But for us, it was godlike power that did it, right? Um, I also think when I, when I look at this saying, any sufficiently advanced technology saying, I always think about, as well, if you're a Star Trek fan, I think about the Prime Directive. I think about, you know, how um, if I go to a, te to a, a technologically, um, you know, a race that's technologically behind, right, they might think that, you know, the person who has a lot of technology, teleportation and all that kind of stuff, uh, from a Star Trek perspective, they might think of it as magic again, like they're gods. And that's why the Prime Directive came about. And so too, for us, is games. In some ways, if you think about it, it's magic, isn't it? Right? The idea that um, 
um, when we kind of connect to a game and we're actually interfacing with the machine, right? The magic for us, it's all smoke and mirrors, if you think about it. All games that we play are just tricks. Our interface, the way it works, um, you know, when we're actually shooting a bullet in, uh, you know, in a first-person perspective game, explosions are just particle systems, you know, it's all an illusion. And really what we're doing is we're producing this magic trick so that people can get entertained. That's what it is. Same thing with um, you know, movies and TV, right? You, you watch a movie, you watch The Mandalorian or some, some other favorite uh, TV show that you're watching. It looks like the person's on a planet, but there's green screens or blue screens now. Um, and there's other kinds of stuff that's, that's happening with um, Unreal um, to produce those backgrounds, to make them look realistic. But really, it's just an illusion. There is no other world that we're, that, that character is actually on. And so too for us in games. So we create these, this magic experience for, for, uh, for users. And I know this is, goes back to game design for you a little bit, but it's I think it's good to keep it from that context. So let's talk about magic and what it stands for. It's a mnemonic. It stands for memories, attention, goals, intuitions, and control. Again, guys, it'll be there'll be some questions around this on your test next week. So this is why I'm, I'm presenting this to you. So memories, you want to make a lasting impression. Attention, you want to command and provide attention to players. Goals, you want to communicate and facilitate the creation of plans and objectives. Intuitions, you want to react. The interface should react in a way the players expect. It should be intuitive when they look at it so that they understand what to do. They can transfer knowledge from the real world into the game world. Okay. Um, control, you want to give the, the player a sense that they have influence and impact on the world. If they don't have impl Im impact on the world, then they're not going to feel satisfied. They're, they're going to lose their flow state. Let's talk about memories a little bit. Again, so imagine if you had to completely relearn your interface every single time that you came and started to, to use the game. That'd be crazy. You wouldn't come back, right? It would take too much. Remember we talked last week? It takes too much commitment for you to do that every single time, right? So we want to make a memorable interface something that's connected to this emotional experience, this flow state that we talked about before. And this is where games, you know, have an advantage over something like uh, movies and shows. They're fun, they're interactive, right? Um, we use stories in games, different symbols, and visual imagery to make things more engaging. And um, we have this heightened emotional state when we're, we're playing because we're engaging the player constantly. Whereas in movies, you might, you know, compose the movie, you might be engaged in some shows, but not others. Some shows might be entertaining to some, but not others. And then, you know, or if you're watching it with somebody else in a social setting, you might be engaged to some degree or another, or it might be just passive. Um, one thing we want to do is we want to encourage exploration through our interface. So we don't want to limit the player to say, okay, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this other thing. One of the challenges that I always have is whenever we make interfaces or you want to make levels, guys, Think about it in, in a Hitchcockian kind of format, right? The texts are open book cat. Um, if there's a shotgun in the scene, we're, we expect the character to use it, all right? If there's no shotgun, that means there's no the character can't use the shotgun if it doesn't appear in the scene. I always say this to my wife too. You know, you buy me candies, I'm going to eat them, all right? That's just the way it is. You buy me chocolates, they're going to be gone, right? You know, if you if you that's that's the that's the the way I'm thinking about it. So if it's in your scene, your players are going to try to use it. That's the that's the idea behind it, right? If you put a bookshelf with books in your scene, the players are going to try and interact with them. If the players can't interact with the bookshelf, right, in the scene, it will break them out of the immersion, right? Or if the books are empty, right? I'm just saying these kind of things. So make sure that it only include things in the scene that players can interact with right as much as possible I know it's tough sometimes if you're just uh, using decor but it's our props but you want to be able to uh, give a sense to the player of what they can and they can't interact with uh, another thing you want to do is you want to create a scene uh, you know your interfaces that are memorable through repetition and consistency so from one scene to the next it's the exact same interface you don't want to you know make this interface totally different on the next scene right at least not at once. You want to kind of gradually change your interface if you need to. Interactions that players need to make, the specific sequence of clicks or gestures, touches, whatever, should be the same for performing the same action. Okay, you're not going to try and switch that up in the next one, all right, in the next scene. 
because that would cause, again, a break of immersion out of flow and it'd be a negative experience. Um, interface components that represent one type of interaction or information should be identical or close to it throughout the interface. Okay. And ask these questions to determine if there are ways you can make your interface more memorable. Do my tutorials and explorations promote exploration and experimentation? Or do I block them? Right? Can I introduce new parts of the interface at periods of emotional engagement within the game? You know, as an example, I want to, you know, add an interface element that interacts with the player when, for example, it's at the end of a scene or something. Can I heighten the emotional uh, connection to interface components by using powerful stimulating imagery as opposed to um, text? I want to avoid text or reduce text as much as possible. And can I reward the player for learning the parts of the interface? If I do this, they're going to remember how to use it better. Okay. How about attention? Attention is bi-directional, right? I need to command players' attention, I need to capture it, and I need to give it to players. Make them feel like they're the central point of the entire game. As we said earlier, the player is the story. The story is the player. Without the player, without the character, there is no story, there is no game. So make the player feel important. Make the player feel like they're the central point of this entire universe. If you don't, if they feel infinitesimal, if they feel insignificant, they won't come back. All right, that's the, that's the, the, the idea behind it. Um, when the players make decisions, right, ask them, you know, engage them. Make it more of an engaging experience, not a passive experience. If it's too passive, their attention will wane and they'll, they'll leave the game. Um, also, the other way, if it's too much information, if you bombard them with information, I'm thinking Flight Simulator. You know, they might leave the game for that re reason because it's it might be too stimulating. There might be too much overflow of information. And um, again, from a commitment perspective, especially in a mobile game, people can't commit to that level of, of complexity a lot of times and they'll just leave. Okay. Another way to, that games command attention is by looking really, really good. All right. And the whole aesthetic, not just looking good, but sounding good too, Cat, because Cat is like, you know, our, uh, our resident... Um, musician, right? Sounding good and looking good, those two things are another way of attracting attention to the game. If the game looks awesome, I want to play it more. If it looks ugly, I don't want to play it anymore, right? I mean, or I'll lose interest, at least over time. In the beginning, I might overlook it, but afterwards, I'm like, wow, this game is the ugliest game I've ever looked at, right? Um, you know, the aesthetics are important, right? Same thing with, look, it's the same thing with movie stars, unfortunately. It's because people like to see aesthetic beauty. So what do they do? They feed us beautiful all the time, right? That may not be the case in a story uh, uh, kind of game, but the interface is what we're talking about here. So sometimes you want characters who are less than perfect because it's more realistic, right? But what I'm saying is in our interfaces, the interface to the game, the way we connect with the game, the way it responds to us, the way it rewards us for using it has to be beautiful. If it isn't, you're going to have less engagement. Um, <clears throat> there are things that we, when we appreciate beauty, we also appreciate things that are new. So I want a game to differentiate itself from other games. So this is something funny. I'm telling you, make it consistent, make, don't reinvent the wheel, but give me something new too, right? Yeah, that's part of the magic. Making a, a really cool interface is give me some new visual characteristics, explain how they work, right? And make it so that it you know, it's slightly different than, you know, the way the other game worked, but very similar and new. If it's a new interface and it's engaging and it's beautiful, I'm going to like it even more. Another thing when it comes to novelty for me, when I think about novelty from an interface perspective, I think about VR. One of the things that happens when you first put on a VR headset, and I just want to put hands up, uh, check marks. Who's used VR in the past and from your group here? Can you put a check mark in the... Yeah, so David's used it. Kevin, I see. I see... Uh, Cats used it and Russ. Okay, cool. Thank you guys for that feedback. So when you first put on that headset, there was a wow factor, right? Isn't there? There's a wow factor when you put on that headset, right? And for me, what happens is it's almost like, not the motion sickness part, no, a wow factor as in like, holy crap, I'm in, I'm in actually in this game world. And in some ways, the novelty of that experience kind of reduces the importance just in the first little bit of the interface just for a while you're like maybe the game isn't that great but holy crap it's vr right i'm in vr and then you don't care so much about 
um, the interface. Later on, as you play the game, when you become more used to that kind of experience, then what ends up happening is your, um, your novelty, the novelty wears off. And then when the novelty wears off, the interface has to be important. If it's not, if it's not a good interface, it doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't matter how much, uh, how new it is, it doesn't matter at all, it has to be good. I'm giving the VR example because whenever you play a VR game for the first time, you're like, wow, this is great. And then you play for a while and you're like, meh. <laughs> Beat Saber is a, a, an example of that um, for sure. Um, so here's some other things to ask when you want to capture and deliver attention. What do I do in the game to make the player feel like the center of attention? So this is the, the, the summary for this one. How can I use beauty and aesthetics in my interface to grab the player's attention? And how do I make a new and differentiated interface? Something that's slightly different than the, what other people have done. So something that's not totally familiar, unfamiliar, but something that's not exactly the same. Goals. Whenever the player has taken action in the game, it is for the furtherance of some kind of goal. If there's no goal for the player, they feel disconnected, right? Um, if the goals dry up, you just want to stop playing. If I've done all my quests, you know, as an example, and there's no more quests to do, uh, even the main quests, you know, you might put the game down. For me, like what I like to do is kind of explore those side quests that I haven't had a chance to kind of hit when I was going to the first run through of my game. I try and go through it again a lot of times if it's interesting enough, right? Um, and a lot of things with quests is you want to inform the player of what those quests are. So I always think about things like a quest system, you know, where, you know, as an example, uh, in the quest system, I have, you know, something that floats up in my interface that says, hey, here's the things that you need to do, right? That keeps me engaged a lot of times. And I'm again, I'm thinking, you know, a quest system like, I don't know, I'm thinking Skyrim. Oh, wait, Skyrim. Bethesda, Microsoft, there was that whole announcement uh, yesterday and today, Microsoft bought Bethesda, and you might have, um, you know, kind of feelings about that. But yeah, um, so inside of the interface, a lot of times we have our goals, right? Almost like this thing where I want to check mark, and I kind of have this OCD kind of feeling. I want to be able to check mark each one of those goals, those sub goals uh, in my quest in order for me to complete my quest. And um, if I play a game like Borderlands, as an example, with my son, and then he wants to turn on another quest. While I haven't completed this quest, it drives me crazy. Why? Because I'm a completionist. I have to make sure that I complete and check mark each one of those goals in order for me to, you know, to be to feel good, right? So that is the um, uh, that's kind of a little bit about goals. Goals can be two types: immediate or long term. So here's an example. I want to get the hell away from this goblin, or longer term. I want to reach level 85 so I can kick the crap out of these goblins, right? Because that's the way we do it. Um, immediate goals are visceral. I got to act quickly. Long-term goals are, they need to be important enough. Um, and I, I talk about a quest system, you know, that might also be something where the, it persists on the screen somewhere in my real estate. Like, hey, I need to check this off. This is the next thing I want to do, you know, kind of thing. Um, I want to be able to, uh, to, to show progress, and you can show progress in terms of a quest system, a progress bar, a mini map, something that shows uh, the player what they're, uh, where they are in the, in, the, in the game and what they're doing next, right? And it's not just about data. It's also about showing them the important information they need uh, in order for them to act. As an example, there's got to be important information that says there's a goblin in front of you. Do you want to attack or flee in a, some kind of RPG, right? So, to make our interface more goal-centered, we can ask some questions. Do I give the player enough information to help them take actions that further their goals? Do I expose the right mix of short, you know, medium, and long-term goals to keep them interested in and continue playing the game, right? Have I shown them a clear way to advance toward the goal um, through some kind of interface, you know? Again, it could be a goal system or something that shows up in their in their uh, heads up display. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is, are clear goals presented within the interface? And again, a lot of these times, these goals are set up in a non-diegetic way. Again, going back to diegetic and non-diegetic, diegetic would be something that you would that the player in a uh, in the game world would actually see. Your avatar would see those things. As an example. Um, non-diegetic are things that you see as the player from a meta 
perspective, metagaming perspective. You can see things like your health level and maybe your, your player, your actual character in the game world may not be able to see those things, right? Because they only see what the player would see. So diegetic versus non-diegetic. One thing to note also is I'm all for minimalist interfaces. So goals and you know activities and all those things should come up when you need them to come up, not all the time to clutter your interface. Intuitions. An intuitive interface is one where when you look at it, you it kind of feels familiar. You know, you can transfer information from the real world into the into the game world. So example, a button would work. You know how to press press a button or flip a switch in the real world. So if I have if I present a switch or a button in the game world, we know what to do. Same with the keyboard. If I have a keyboard um, and again, this is how keyboards came about. It was based on this old Remington typewriter, right? Remington typewriter. And, you know, we made keyboards because it was an analog of something that already existed in the real world, right? So it's the same thing with things we bring into the game world. It's got to be something we're familiar with, okay? And we can use imagery like this as well. What we do is we create a mental model for, for uh, players when we bring in something like an icon or a symbol that, that makes sense in the real world. Example, I want to show them some kind of volume control. I'm going to bring in a speaker icon. The speaker icon speaks to them. They've seen it before on their smartphones. They've seen it before on other interfaces. It's something they can relate to. They can transfer knowledge from things that they've already done into something that they're doing here with you, right? If it's something that's not transferable and it's not intuitive, the interface is not intuitive, players are going to be less satisfied. It's going to take longer for them to ramp up. You don't want that. You want engagement immediately, as fast as possible. So transfer of skills and make, make use of the game interface as fast as you can. Some things that you can do is um, uh, your, new, your interface will be new to the player. Sometimes it happens, and that's normal because not every part of your interface will be the exact same. We talked about how you want to make it novel as well. The trick is to make this the learning process, learning your, your, your interface, super transparent. So things like, hey, it's... I just got a tooltip that told me what to do. And sometimes what you want to do is if a user takes a long action, something that takes way longer than they should take, for example, they need to open the door, but they really, they've been hovering in a room for a long time. Give them a help, hint, hey, guy, you know, girl, click on that, uh, on the door, open the open this up. Or, you know what, um, in your interface, when, um, I'm going to give them feedback if they've done something wrong, error correction. I want to say something like, Hey, you know, you're in a game world and I'm playing, uh, <clears throat> for example, Doom Eternal and I can't for the life of me kill this, this, uh, this enemy. Then uh, this little enemy, you know, kind of tutorial comes up and says, shoot here, shoot here. This is the way you kill this enemy, right? This is good. It, it kind of talks to the world, the game world, and it explains how you can use your interface into the world, your controls and the, the heads up display uh, to do what you need to do. Labels are very explicit ways of saying, hey, do this, show this. It's very explicit, and you want to reduce that as much as possible because you want to kind of uh, keep the text minimal. So ask these questions when you want to build intuitive interfaces. Um, where have I got carried away with making things cool at the expense of making things familiar? Okay, that's one of the, the things you want to ask. Did I make it really cool looking, but then does the player know what, not know what to do? Um, can I find objects from the real world that would be familiar to players in the game world? Can I bring them in, right? And what metaphors can I leverage with icons and symbols, things that we know about, uh, to, to have them use the interface? Let's talk about control. So we want to give the players a sense of agency or control, right? If they feel passive, um, they might even feel hopeless if they can't control their, their, uh, their game. Think of it this way. If I force a player to watch a cutscene, or if I force a player to do the tutorial, they're losing control. I want to give the player a chance to play the game the way they want and to, you know, to experience the game the way they like. If they don't want to see cutscenes, give them an option to, to, uh, um, uh, to opt out. I don't want to see this cutscene. Or if they don't want to do the tutorial because they might be an experienced player and they want to jump right to gameplay, give them that option. You might not recommend it. You might say it's recommended you do the tutorial. But if they don't want it, let them, you know, kind of uh, opt out from it, right? You'd never want to do this. You don't want to 
focus the player on a particular scene because it's going to further your story. If the player wants to walk away and he doesn't want to hear your main quest, that's on him or her, right? What you want instead is for them to have choice. The more choices you give your player and if they have effects on the world, the better it is for gameplay and engagement, right? So when they do perform an action, they need to get feedback immediately. Everything from audio feedback, visual feedback, uh, haptic feedback in their controller, everything so that they know that their action or inaction has consequences, that they've affected the game world in some way. Um, and a, we want to reward players, not penalize them, right? A lot of times we want to give them rewards, you know, for simple, simple acknowledgements that things are working, you know, things like I can, when I get into a car in the game world, I hear the hum of an engine, you know, the ignition in the car. I want to, you know, give badges or points when they've done something correct. All those kind of things. Feedback is a huge uh, important thing that shows them that whatever they've done in the game world is actually working or not working. Um, so when I think about control, we can ask these questions. Do I provide a reaction for every action or inaction? Do I provide a reaction? Do I make it safe for players to probe the interface and learn the tutorial? That's one of the biggest problems we have. If, if I feel anxious, anxiety, right, for learning how to, to play the game, Dark Souls, right, then maybe some players won't play that game. They'll shy away from it. Some players love that kind of intensity, right? You know, but other players don't, especially casual gamers. They want to be able to play in a, in a safe area and figure things out. That's why so many new games now that come out come up with a creative mode, a way of going in, figuring out how to play the game, and then going back in, in, into competitive mode after. And also, can I figure out a way of cutting down the number of steps to getting them engaged in my gameplay as soon as possible? That is one, those are kind of things I can think about when I want to engage control. All right, before I get into step into play heuristics, I've kind of covered the uh, mobile game design aspects just until now. Are there any questions or thoughts, any kind of feedback you want to talk about them from the material that I presented to you? So we talked about flow state. We talked about magic, which is, you know, memories, right? We wanted to talk about um, all the aspects of, of things, attention, right? Goals, intuitions, and control. Those are the ways you want to think about when you think about the magic interfaces, right? Any feedback at all? Any thoughts let's think about um, our play heuristics so we have something called from a game user research perspective I've kind of put this this document up on blackboard for you there's something called play heuristics think about a heuristic as a an experience or an element of a game all right and what we want to do is this is a checklist when it comes to game design. I want you guys to use this, if possible, as you're designing your game for next week, your assignment number one. And think about these aspects. Think about how do I design my game so it takes advantage of these heuristics. So here's one. Let's talk about the first category, which is gameplay. Heuristic A says enduring play. Look at these the check marks. And you may have seen this list before with me. The players finds the game fun with no repetitive or boring tasks. Again, it supports the stuff that we said already when it comes to interfaces. The player should not experience being penalized repetitively for the same failure. You fail once, fine, but don't keep hitting me for the same problem. Move me along, help me out, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, the player should not lose any hard-won possessions. I always think about Minecraft, uh, you know, as an example, when I, when I lose all my possessions, or Dark Souls for some reason. Dark Souls, I go in, I have a sword, I die, I've lost everything again, right? Um, and it, it promotes this anxiety for the player because they're like, man, I just lost all my stuff. I spent all this time investing in this game. And remember, from a mobile game perspective, this is even twice as, you know, twice more important. Um, gameplay is long and enduring and keeps the player's interest. So when I say long and enduring here, it means that it's not going to be just for one session. You can play this game over and over again. There are, there's a series of goals that they have that you're going to keep them interested in so they can play this game again and again. Any fatigue or boredom was minimized by varying activities and pacing during the game. So I'm not going to do the exact same killing action every single time. Maybe there's going to be parts of my game where I need to avoid enemies and other parts of the game that I need to shoot enemies, right? 
um, if you vary these the activities, it becomes more interesting to play. Challenge and st strategy and pace. Um, challenge, strategy, and pace are in balance. So remember we talked about challenge versus skill. This is important. And the game is paced to apply pressure without frustrating players. The difficulty level varies so players experience greater challenges as they develop. And B3 tells us it's easy to learn and harder to master. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Challenges are positive game experience rather than negative game experiences, resulting in wanting to play more than quitting. AI is balanced with the player's play, and it's tough enough that the players have to try different tactics against it. For your AI, for assignment number one, it's pretty simple. I'm not looking for it to be too challenging. What I'm looking for at least is some kind of line of sight or detection radius so that it can, uh, you know, kind of pathfind towards the player. Um, from a game world perspective, the game world reacts to the player and remembers their passage through it. These are all things we've talked about so far. The idea that their actions have, you know, kind of um, results. They have re uh, there's a reaction for every action the player makes. Changes the player make in the game world are persistent and noticeable if they backtrack to where they have been before. Guys, by the way, I didn't make any of these things up. These are all done through research. What makes a good game? What makes a, a rewarding game, you know, in general? Um, the game goals are clear. The game provides clear goals, presents overriding goals early as well as short-term goals throughout gameplay. The skills needed to attain goals are taught early enough to play or use later or right before the new skill is needed. And this is a, a key thing as well. Sometimes we don't want to put our uh, this new skill that you're teaching me inside of my, you know, in the freezer somewhere where I'm going to defrost it later on. I need it to be used right then. If you're teaching me a skill, it's because I need it right now, right? And that's how I'm going to use it, right? Um, we talked about goals a little bit. I'm going to skip over. The game supports a variety of game styles. The game is balanced with multiple ways to win. That's an important thing. Don't just make play for one type of player. And here's a key, not just for games, E3, but for also for movies. The first 10 minutes of play and player actions are painfully obvious and should result in immediate and positive feedback for all types of players. This is true for movies too. In the first 10 minutes, I know who the protagonist is, who the antagonist is, what the story is about, what the challenge is, and what the call to action is. I should know that within the first 10 minutes. If I don't, a lot of us get bored, right? Um, the game had different AI settings so we can challenge the players at different levels. I think this is tough to, to implement um, in the beginning when, you have it, when you're just making your game. But you should plan on, on how do I turn up the challenge level if I want to, if I want to support players who are more advanced, right? And, and one of the things is here that we want to think about players who are um, players who are new to play and players who are advanced. I want to give them the chance to play their own way. All right. Players feel control and they have a sense of control to influence the game world. We talked about that a little bit. Um, category two now is around coolness, entertainment, humor and emotional immersion. Um, there is an emotional connection between the player and the game world as well as with their avatar. There's a whole... There's games out there that spend a mini game making your avatar, choosing your loadout, call it what you like, right? You're making if you're making a Frogger game today, right? For your for your assignment for next week, think about maybe giving the frog a different set of skins, a brown frog or a different kind of frog, a green frog, or whatever with different skin colors or different textures. It makes it more interesting. It engages the player. They have an emotional attachment. That's why games like, um, you know, Fortnite. And all the RPGs out there from, you know, Oblivion to Dark Souls, as an example, um, they give you the, the ability for you to customize your character a little bit to make them look the way you like, right? Even though you may never see them, they may never see their face, but it's really cool to do those little changes. You get emotionally invested and you can do that even with your mobile games. It's not a big deal. The game offers some different uh, something different in terms of attracting retainers players interest so again we talked about this differentiation thing okay one thing that's really tough is this idea of humor we you know something that's funny to me may not be funny to you so really be careful with the humor part right you know you really have to have a great sense of timing and um, you may be catering to one niche the more you apply your humor uh, in, the, in the game. So be careful around this. It can limit your audience a little bit. Um, let's move on uh, to the last part, which is usability and game mechanics. Players does not need to read the manual or documentation to play. That makes sense. We don't have very, ma very big manuals these days. Anyway, 
uh, players does not need to access the tutorial in order to play. So again, I can skip the tutorial, like I said before. Game controls are consistent with the game and follow standard conventions. So you know what? When I use a controller, I can, I, I'm pretty much going to know that you know the upper button on the uh, on the on the top face of the controller, the face button on the top, which is usually the Y button, or the face button on the bottom, which is usually the A button, is one of the buttons that I'm going to using for. I'm going to use the jump. I'm going to do one of those two or activate. Um, you know that kind of thing. So use the standard conventions so that people can start playing quickly. Um, status score indicators are seamless, obvious, and available, and do not interfere with gameplay. Again, think about a minimalist interface. Controls are intuitive and mapped in a natural way. They are customizable and default to the industry. Customizable is really important. Some people really like to play, um, you know, inverted Y. And you might say, what? Inverted Y? Boomer? You know, there's a lot of people who play, who are older like me, who play inverted, right? And they're like, wait, you play inverted, Tom? Yeah, because I started playing, you know, simulators way back in the day, and that's how we played, right? Um, but if my, when my, my kid starts playing the game, he's like, Dad, he, come on, why are you playing inverted? Because that's the way I play it. I want an option to do that. And not just me, other people too. Um, uh, Kat says, is it true for mobile games? Certain it's the first 10 seconds because people put it down after 20 seconds if they don't know what's going on. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think if you're going to play, um, I think within the first 10 minutes would be the limit, right? As an example. I don't think that um, beyond 10 minutes of play, if you can get 10 minutes of play out of your game audience for a mobile game, it's huge. But I'm saying generally, uh, Kat, for any game, 10 minutes, if you can't, you know, tell the audience what they're doing within 10 minutes of gameplay, it's over, right? And they're never going to play that game again, chances are. Um, let's keep on going with a couple of more. I'm not going to talk about all of them. Some of them are the same. Um... Screen layout is efficient, integrated, and visually pleasing. The player experiences the user uh, interface as consistent in controller, color, typographic, dialogue, and user interface design. The player experiences the user interface HUD as part of the game. Art is recognizable to the player and speak to its function. So again, that's that's going back to the idea of I take real world knowledge and I bake it into the game. And so it's intuitive from an interface perspective. Okay. And error prevention is important. So again, Whenever I think about error prevention, I always think if the, if the person is stuck in a room, help them out. If the person is stuck uh, killing an enemy or avoiding a, uh, an obstacle, help them out. And we can do that with a series of non-diegetic interface elements like an arrow that points to the doorknob. Open the door. Open the door. Visual, auditory, everything. Anything to help that player understand what needs to be done. This is part of the whole tutorialization process, but it could also last later on in the game. For example, I go back to that Doom Eternal thing where they tell you, hey, if you get, if you get stuck, if you got killed by a specific enemy that we've already told you how to beat, guess what we're going to do? We're going to show you the same screen that comes up to, to, to help you, you know, uh, beat that enemy again. Okay. So this, you know, um, play heuristics document, I'm giving it to you as a checklist. I'm expecting that when you hand in your game design document that I'm going to see elements like this that you've thought about a little bit deeper when it comes to planning your game than just around I want to make Frogger. I want to redo, you know, uh, Space Invaders. I want to, you know, do this other game, um, you know, that um, that I saw that's a classic Hargay game and I have a, I've got I've added nothing uh, from my perspective at all, you know, into the game to make it better or improve it from a mobile perspective, right? So keep it in mobile in mind, but also think about from a user heuristics perspective. Heuristics are things that have been tested and researched. There's been re uh, game user research and responses, feedback about kind of best practices on what, how to make uh, you know general game experience. And I think if you can't cover at least some of these things, or if you haven't thought about them, I think there's a high chance that you won't have a great game from an immersion perspective. Okay, that's really what I wanted to, wanted to cover from a uh, mobile game user interface design um, kind of idea. I'm going to pause the video here. We've kind of gone in about an hour and I think I'm about half an hour ahead of where I was in the first time I ran this thing um, for various reasons. Um, before we stop, are there any questions or you know feedback, any kind of thoughts around the stuff that I presented so far from a design perspective today? And again, you can put up your hand, uh, or you can put a, uh, you know, a check mark or something like that. 
because sometimes it's faster than actually put typing stuff into the text chat. All right, looks like we got, we're good. So I'm going to pause the, oh, I got John. John, talk to me. You can put a text if you want, or you can talk on the mic. It's up to you. But you are being recorded on YouTube. So after this, what I'm going to do, we're, we're going to be doing while John is, I don't know, formulating his, his question is um, I'm going to be pausing it. We're going to take a 15 minute break. And when we come back, we're going to get into the Unity piece, right? And then I'm going to be talking about how to make simple interfaces to navigate in Unity. I'm also going to rebuild, um, you know, kind of our connection to Jenny Motion, and I'm going to use a different um, uh, simulator coming up. I'm going to use the Galaxy S10 as opposed to the Galaxy S7 just to show you the difference. For those people who are using a, an iPhone, I'm also at some point going to talk about how to display things with Xcode and the iPhone simulator. No problem, John. All right, guys, that's it for me for this video. So I'm going to stop recording now and then uh, we'll be back in about 15 minutes.